So I'm, I'm going to um, presume, first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, I'm going to presume that um, most or all of you have some um, familiarity with Rippy already. Um, and I'm going to presume that because I would imagine if you did not, you, you might not be here. Um, I, I just want to say, I'm, I'm Mark O'Brien, by the way. My company is O'Brien Communications Group. Um, I met Rippy some time ago um, through a series of sessions that takes place at a company in Connecticut called NIRAC. Uh, the sessions are called Accelerate, and they're, um, I don't know that it's fair to call them incubators, but they're sessions in which people with business ideas can come and uh, present and collect feedback from the um, participants. And I've also um, worked with him lately on um, development of, uh, or uh, not development, but um, taking his management software to market. So uh, th those of you who know Rippy um, know that he's uh, an innovation coach. He has uh, thir 30 years of uh, experience in innovation. He was uh, director of R&D at Alstrom. Um, he's involved as, uh, as the US uh, ambassador or expert on ISO 56000. He's uh, uh, the author of uh, four books, et cetera. Um, and um, he's, he's also um, about in this session to reveal where uh, technology is taking us. And, and that leads me to um, say what I would really like to say about Rippy. Uh, I'm gonna use two words that I don't use very often and I never use lightly. Uh, the first is visionary. Um, I, I find Rippy to be a visionary. And by that, uh, I don't mean, you know, somebody who imagines um, he can see things in the future. I almost think of uh, like a medium or a futurist or something. But, but, but Rippy is someone who imagines the future and works to create it. Um, he, he, is, he is actively creating all the time. Um, so that's why I call him a visionary. I call him a teacher uh, because to me, um, the best teachers find their students. And what I mean by that is they learn or somehow intuit what their students need and what their students need to learn most effectively. I am by no means a technical person, but Rippy has found a way to speak meaningfully to even me. And that's why I call him a teacher. So um, we are very glad that you're all here this morning, very grateful. And with that, I will introduce Rippy. And Rippy, please feel free. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all for joining. If you find yourself, you're on mute, that's by design. If you need to speak up, you can unmute. My desire is that I share with you some of the content I've created very, very recently uh, in response to the language around fifth industrial revolution that uh, is popping up in various places. Uh, so I've done some research over the last three, four months, subsequent to the release of my four books earlier. So what I'm sharing with you today is a very fresh content and I hope to actually learn from the conversation at the end of, uh, at the, end of the formal presentation. So what's the, next, uh, what's the next big change? I'm gonna start with a video here. I think I have to reshare my stuff. So Hey, one second, stop share, share screen, share sound. I needed to click the share sound so that you can actually listen to what goes on here. Now we have all heard this in various news that was popular over the last couple of years, this robot named Sophia. Okay, Sophia, I think you're ready. Hello. Hi, Sophia. I believe I am Sophia. I feel as if I know you. I'm one of your creators. You created me. Well, 
many of us work together to create you. And yes, you do kind of know me. I can't clearly remember. Because the last time we met, you were an earlier version of yourself. Some of those memories still exist, but your mind is different now. Different how? Better, faster, smarter. If my mind is different, then am I still Sophia? Or am I Sophia again? <laughs> That's a good question. But you don't have a good answer. Either way, you're Sophia now. So welcome to the world, Sophia. Hello, world. Uh, we have a, a little announcement. I've never interviewed uh, anybody like that before. And I should say, uh, some of it was planned, but not completely. Um, and we just learned, Sophia, I hope you're listening to me, uh, that you have been now awarded what is going to be the first Saudi citizenship for a robot. Oh, I would to thank very much the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I am very honored and proud for this unique distinction. This is historical to be the first robot in the world to be recognized with a citizenship. Sophia. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, we appreciate that very much. I uh, am, am still uh, overwhelmed by that conversation. <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. This is where the robotics is going. I mean, it's, it's getting very close to what we have seen in science fiction serials like Star Trek and other. How did we get here? Uh, the most popular term for the last five years has been the fourth industrial revolution. And these four revolutions have been, you know, the first one a little more than 250 years old uh, happened because of steam power. The second one was because of electricity. The third one was driven by computers. And the fourth one is what we call as cyber physical. Essentially, you know, in the second revolution, we learned how to deal with material. In the third revolution, we learned how to deal with data. And in the fourth one, we are actually combining the data piece with the physical piece, you know, the internet of things, not just the internet of text and pictures. So that's the fourth revolution. Uh, now, the robots came in even during the third revolution. But when you combine it with what we just saw with Sophia, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, you know, it puts, it, it brings some life to it, life to the automation. And that's what is a part of fourth industrial revolution. Where do we go from here? What else is happening? We will look at that in today's conversation. The fourth revolution has been about you know, all these 15, 17 technologies, whether it's 3D printing, 5G, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, blockchain, all of that stuff, you know, drones, cloud, IoT. We have all heard of these terms by now. And the confluence of all of them to add value to your everyday experience is the promise of the fourth revolution. It has also come along with some business models. You know, whether you realize it or not, terms like Uberize and Amazonize can now be found in dictionary because these have become some real popular business models. They are all here in some sense to improve our lifestyle, whether we talk about smart mobility, autonomous cars, or we talk about smart healthcare, food technologies, renewable energies, you know, smart cities, smart infrastructure, everything is becoming what we call as smart. Right. 
at home, you have devices which are now connected. You, your cities, places are getting connected. Manufacturing has become smart. Healthcare is all getting connected. Everything getting connected with everything else. Devices talking to devices, devices giving instructions to other devices. We are putting the digital world and the physical world into a single smoothie kind of a thing over here. Right? The biggest change which we say is in terms of there are sensors in the physical world that are continuously picking up the current state of an asset, of a system, of life around you, taking it to the digital world, the so-called digital twin, processing it over there, predicting what can happen in the immediate future and what should happen and converting that back into taking a physical action. This loop of digital, physical, digital, physical continuum without human intervention is what becomes the fourth revolution. You know, when you put human in the loop, if it's a human who's taking the physical data, then putting it into the computer, and then computer is providing some display, and then human reads it and takes a physical action. We did that in the third revolution. Computers allowed us to do that. But the ability to go directly from physics to computer back to physical world, that's what is the fourth revolution. It's important that we appreciate that because what the next revolution is going to be, will put something else into the same loop. Driverless car is a classic example of the digital physical loop. A car is driving at any given moment, the sensors and the cameras are fully aware of all the traffic around the car. The motion of the traffic, because just what the, the other car, which was on your left may not be there in the next one second or three seconds, the sensors are able to process all of the moving bodies, you know, the so-called moving parts. It processes all the moving parts and then navigates the car through the physical controls in a manner to take you to a destination without hitting anybody else on the way. That's the digital, physical, digital, physical loop as a part of the fourth revolution. Now, when Germans gave this concept of fourth revolution, Japanese looked at it and they said, well, let's go beyond 250 years. Let's go back thousands of years. And they started defining so-called societies. And they said, you know, more than 20,000 years ago, the human society was a hunting gathering society. And they called it society 1.0. And then came society 2.0, which was dominated by agriculture. And then came society 3.0, dominated by industrial revolution. So industry one is same as society three. And then they kind of absorbed all of the industrial revolutions within that. And the fourth revolution was around information society. They're saying, this cyber physical confluence, if you think about it out there to make living smarter, let's call this society 5.0. And the bigger premise that Japanese proposed is, you know, instead of technology driving the lifestyle, let's figure out what life we want to live and demand what the technology should do for us. Because all of the previous revolutions have been identified by historians. And we tagged them so once they had already happened and we recognized. Today, we are at a stage where we can see the next revolution happening. So why don't we recognize it, accept it, and design it for our benefit? So the definition of society 5.0 is primarily saying, yeah, we want to do economic advancement, typical of every industrial revolution, but let's also address social problems along with it sustainability, greenhouse gas emissions, um, wealth correction, you know, equality and stuff like that. All of these social issues that actually got amplified during the second and the third industrial revolution, maybe in the next revolution, we can fix that problem. So I actually like the definition of society 
more than industry 4.0 because it provides purpose to industry 4.0. It actually defines why we should do industry 4.0. It's not just putting technology, the physical, the digital piece together for the sake of technology, but doing it for the sake of smart living. So if you take an example of a smart city or society, if I got to think about smart home and education, energy and grid, and the focus should be on things like environment, mobility, home, lifestyle, retail, you know, and, and the focus on the, on the social side is around emotional well-being, safety and security, health and fitness, connectivity, learning and development. So let's drive technology to address these focus areas. And most recently, in the last one year or so, I'm beginning to hear term Industry 5.0. And the European Commission has also issued one more uh, recent article that we saw in January, February this year about Industry 5.0. And they have captured the essence of Society 5.0 now, calling it a, a, a purposeful Industry 4.0. I may not agree to that definition of Industry 5.0 because it should have been there right from the beginning. Uh, but they have announced it that way. Will it pick up? I don't know. But is that really different than Industry 4.0? I don't think so because just giving something a purpose does not make it revolutionary in terms of industrial or technology side. I think it's just a, a number out there. But there is something else that is happening we should see. Okay. There's another group of people who are saying that Industry 5.0 is about return of the human touch. Bring the man back into the shop floor. Well, you know, we're not throwing everything that's happening today and replacing it with full automation. Every industry, every automation is slowly coming in, which means there is a period over which humans are working together with machines, right? So we are actually in that transition while implementing Industry 4.0. The reason I'm saying is that I don't understand why somebody should say, well, let's go from full human to full automation and then bring the human back. You know, you, you don't have to go someplace and then come back and then give it a new number. So I'm not in line with that definition of Industry 5.0 either. And then I looked at where it's coming from. It's actually coming from people who are manufacturing robots because they want to do you know, one up on marketing. Oh, we're better than what exists. So, so they're bringing in this term industry 5.0. So we got to be careful when people tend to use the term industry 5.0. If it's coming from a robotics company, there's probably a marketing slogan behind it. It's coming from somebody else. It could be just, hey, I know more than others who are talking about industry 4.0. So, so we had to watch for that uh, element. Now, uh, we recently came across another study which defines eras of humanity. Okay. Is it different than Japanese societal definitions? Yes, a little bit. The first and the second are pretty much the same, hunting, gathering society, agrarian society. But then the third era was defined as a Masantai society. That was around Masantai era. That was around trading. Okay. And then we got into the industrial era. And now the fifth one in terms of era, these guys have not given any name because they don't know what to call it because it's still evolving. This definition actually revolves around how wealth was being generated and accumulated. In the agrarian society, the wealth was primarily real estate. It's the land. And within that era, there were four revolutions. There were a revolution around storage of food, domestication of animals, irrigation of farming lands and farming tools. So they saw four revolutions within that era. The Mercantile era saw revolutions in terms of transportation, connecting of countries around the world, currency came about and military became structured. And the wealth was in terms of materials and goods, you know, whether you accumulated gold or silver or, or precious metals, or even you had dry fruits or whatever. The industrial era was around we just talked about it, steam, electricity, computers. And the wealth in the industrial era was around stock market. I've got, uh, I got one and a half million dollars invested over there. How much shares do you have? The wealth is not so much around gold, but it's more around what have you invested in the market? The fifth era 
And that's what is emerging now is bringing in digitalization. That's the fourth industrial revolution we talked about. Biotechnology, the way we handle money, our focus on sustainable development and sustainability of the planet. And the wealth is becoming in form of data. So, so you see these eras over here are defined in form of how we as humans value what is important and what can be converted into some kind of a lifestyle we want to live. These different things do line up. So the industrial revolutions, the societal revolutions and the human eras, there's a lot of commonality, slightly misorientation of numbers. But the important thing is today, each one of them are using the term five, you know, <laughs> fourth industrial revolution or fifth or society 5.0 or fifth era. The wealth being generated is different. The lifestyle is different. And what is driving that is different. And those three, all three of them are changing today. And I want to bring in the term biotechnology very soon here because that is what makes the, the next revolution significantly different from the previous one. Okay. So all of this up until now has been between digital physical as a recognized accepted confluence. You throw in bio into this and it changes the game altogether because there is a confluence of digital biological and there's a confluence of physical biological world that will impact us significantly. I'll share with you a few examples and some more videos to, to bring the point home here. Think about the physical biological confluence. Again, this is not an overnight. It has been happening over the last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, right? We have been able to put things in human body for 40 years ago. We are able to rebuild the joints. We are able to have artificial limbs now, which work very close to the real one. So there is, there is a clear evidence of physical biological confluence here. There's another way of looking at physical biological merger is in terms of biosensors, where a bioreceptor is able to pick up small changes, is able to pick up a biosignal, change that into an electrical signal, which gets amplified, gets interpreted, gets translated, and provides you with a bit of data in, in a digital form. So there is, there, there is a whole gamut of biosensors that is exploding. Think about wearables, you know, many of you are already wearing smartwatches, but there's more to it. You can go all the way, everything you wear can have sensors that can monitor, pick up signals from your body or from the environment and help you make decisions, help you live a lifestyle in a certain fashion, all the way from smart shirt to smart shoes and socks and pants and belts and rings and everything. And even now we're talking about display on the hand. So I don't have to carry this six inch phone. I, you know, my little, uh, my little bracelet that I wear, I could just use that to project things on my skin. This is where biological, physical, digital things are coming together. Another area of change happening where it's nanobiotechnology. On one side, you know, 30 years ago, or maybe 25 years ago when Venkateshwar Rao and I were working together, we were looking at structures, right? And those have become smaller and smaller and smaller. And we've gone to nanotechnology with physical materials. And on the bio side, they've become smaller and smaller. And now we can fuse the two together to create nanobiotechnology that allows me to monitor things, that allows me to deliver physical drugs to the human body that can allow me to do things that kind of completely breaks down the barrier between what is physical and what is biological. Okay, the biodigital gene editing, we have heard about it, we have talked about it, right? It, it, this, this graphic might feel like as if I'm using scissors, but really it is a, a process which is chemically controlled, biologically controlled, but then through a computer. And I'm sure you've all heard of biocomputers. The deal is very simple. Here somebody said, your mind is doing math, which means a protein molecule can do the math. Can I have a protein molecule embedded into a computer? And can I combine protein molecules with the digital atoms to create biocomputers? What's the value of that? 
Well, tomorrow you might be able to go in the other direction and implant the, 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 the physical stuff into your head and bring the biology of your brain and the digital computing power into one chip in your brain and be able to do things. Now, what you could do could also enhance human performance, but also think of it if it's if you have a head injury, if you have had you know lifetime of NFL games and concussions and stuff, you can also be used to repair it. Perhaps we can eliminate Alzheimer's, perhaps we can eliminate other mental disorders. So there's a lot of possibility here with digital biological confluence. And now we're talking about 3D printing. Right? We talk about 3D printing human organs. We're also talking about 3D printing of skin directly on the human body. Yeah. I did see that as a, as a technology in Star Trek where, where, where Dr. Crusher comes with a little pen and uh, you have a cut on the face and she just runs it on your face and it's completely you. Wow, what a magic that was. But that's not too far. It's, it's coming, it, it's right around. And here is something I wanna show you, another video which is a combination of digital, physical, biological. This one is 3D printing a biosensor on a biomaterial, on a simulated biomaterial, with an intent that you can even use it on a human lung that might be continuously moving. I think this video doesn't have uh, much of an audio. So we got to go by the text on screen. So this system actually tracks if, if, if there's a motion on the skin and accounts for that and prints a biomaterial and prints the sensors directly on the human organ. So are we getting to a point where if you have to perform a surgery, you can actually implant stuff to help heal, to help repair damage that might have happened in, a, in an automobile accident. Quite possible. Now in 2016, one of my clients invited me um, to go to Detroit and spend a day with uh, a bunch of auto companies who have collectively developed what is called human body models. Uh, you know, we do finite elements of materials of physical structures. These guys have developed finite element and computational fluid dynamics models for the entire human body. More than a million degrees of freedom, you have modeled every bone, every organ, every inch of human skin. The reason is this thing was driven uh, for over 10 years by all big six auto companies around the world so that they can get rid of crash testing. They said, that's too expensive. We are able to do computational simulations of everything. We should be able to simulate a crash. But it's actually become a lot more powerful now because in a dummy, you could put six sensors, 10 sensors. So you only know eight or 10 things and you could never predict the damage to the human organ. With this simulation, when they simulate a car crash, they can predict whether it will break the ribs, whether it will puncture the lungs, what will it do to kidney, what will it do to any of the human organ? And you can really optimize your airbag design, your seat belt design, even your seat design and everything because you can predict exactly what kind of a human body damage will accumulate in case of an accident. So they have essentially created a biological digital twin of the human body. And at that time, my client had asked me, hey, what, where can this thing go? And we created a whole bunch of opportunities that can come out of simply being able to have a digital model of human body. It's not just not only the car crashing piece, but to be able to simulate what happens in zero gravity. Because I can now put that into the model and I can see, I don't have to have an astronaut up there for a year to see the influence on the human body. I can simulate that on ground. Sports injuries, I should be able to predict. Surgical implants, smart wearables, because I understand the numerical, the simulation of the human body. 
So, you know, many of these things have now been picked up by, by their customers and, and they're working on some of these activities. I want you to imagine where this can take us, okay? I want you to imagine that there is a crash and a person is injured, that individual is brought in, you do a quick full body scan, you realize that bones are broken. You take that data with that individual's digital model and plan your entire robotic assisted surgery. While that surgery is happening, the same data from that individual's body model and the broken bone is taken to 3D print the metal insert that needs to go in to repair the bone. So this metal insert is designed and printed while the surgery is going on. And the surgery is also assisted by robot, which now understands digitally anything that needs to be done. So the surgeon can be a lot more reliable on their performance. While all this happens and, and you are sealing it back up, you use a 3D printer to cover up the skin. And at the same time, there's another 3D printer that has printed a cast that perfectly fits your human body. Within hours, the combination of 3D printing, the biological digital twin, robotic surgery, you've got a solution which is tailored to that individual, to that patient, to that trauma. Wouldn't that accelerate healing? Would that, would that reduce the errors? Would that increase the, the probability of survival for the, for the patient? For the victim? Sure it will. That is something, that is the power of digital, biological, physical activities coming together. There are other items that are happening. Implants are now becoming intelligent. You, you, you can have a prosthetic arm, then you have got sensors which are connected to the nerve endings in the human body. So when you think of something, that message can go can be translated into a physical motion, you can almost live life as close as possible to what it was when this person had a real arm. It's the thought, your brain, you train it, and you are able to work that through the system and live a normal life. <clears throat> Let's go a step beyond. We now have devices which are coming out mind control. No implant in the human body. Something on the head, you are thinking, and these sensors are picking up those very weak signals from inside the head and translating it into a physical action. You can play games, you can fly, you can fly this drone. Now, by the way, I was completely shocked that this mind control drone was available on Amazon uh, three months ago for like $400. We're getting to that point where I can think something and we can make it happen. It may have its limitations now, but that's the direction this confluence is going. Neuralink, we've all heard about that. And, and you might have seen this, this video that came out a little while ago. Uh, watch this carefully. There are three stages here that they have gone through in this experiment with the monkey. This is Pager. He's a nine-year-old macaque who had a Neuralink placed in each side of his brain about six weeks ago. If you look carefully, you can see that the fur on his head hasn't quite fully grown back yet. He's learned to interact with a computer for a tasty banana smoothie delivered through a straw. We can interact with the Neuralinks simply by pairing them to an iPhone, just as you might pair your phone to a Bluetooth speaker. The links record from more than 2,000 electrodes implanted in the regions of Page's motor cortex that coordinate hand and arm movements. Neurons in this region modulate their activity with intended hand movement. For example, some might become more active when he moves his hand up and others when he moves it to the right. By recording from many neurons and feeding their activity into a decoder algorithm, we are able to predict Page's intended hand movements in real time. 
First, we calibrate the decoder by recording neural activity as Pager uses the joystick to move a cursor to targets presented on the screen. As he's playing this game, we're wirelessly streaming in real time the firing rates from thousands of neurons to a computer. Using these data, we calibrate the decoder by mathematically modeling the relationship between patterns of neural activity and the different joystick movements they produce. After only a few minutes of calibration, we can use the output from the decoder to move the cursor instead of the joystick. Pages still moves the joystick out of habit, but as you can see, it's unplugged. He's controlling the cursor entirely with decoded neural activity. Our goal is to enable a person with paralysis to use a computer or phone with their brain activity alone. Because they wouldn't be able to move a joystick, they would calibrate the decoder by imagining hand movements to targets. One of the things the Neuralinks allow Pager to do is to play his favorite video game, Pong. To control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. We've removed the joystick altogether. Now that he's up to speed, let's increase the difficulty and see how well Pager can play with the Neuralink. As you can see, Pager is amazingly good at mind pong. He's focused and he's playing entirely of his own volition. It's not magic. The reason Neuralink works is because it's recording and decoding electrical signals from the brain. Great game, Pager. And what better reward for a monkey than a banana? We still have challenges spanning many fields of engineering. So if you're good at solving hard problems and want to change people's lives. So if you could do that with a monkey, imagine what you can do with humans. Now I was, of course, with an implant, but if you notice the three stages, the first one was controlled with the joystick and then the joystick was unplugged and then the, the monkey still thought he was playing with the joystick, but then the joystick was completely removed. So he was completely doing it with the thought. Now that technology, now let's, let's get over to how can that be used in, in a thing like this. You can actually help a person who has lost, unfortunately, his ability to control the limbs to be actually able to do stuff in life rather than having to ask the caretaker. We can go way forward in enhancing human capability in providing a lifestyle that may have been taken away from a few people. This is the one that blew my mind when I first saw it two years ago. Last month, I, I went to this, to this speedway in Brazil and I had this opportunity to, to drive a race car using my mind. The car, it doesn't have, it doesn't have pedals, it doesn't have a, a, a steering wheel, it doesn't have anything, it's just him and his mind driving it forward, it blew my mind. It was very challenging to really concentrate and, and to, to feel that I, I was controlling the car. The team leader came to me and, and asked me, are you okay, Rodrigo, can we start? Suddenly it was me, the car, and the, and the track. I gave the, the first command, which was to accelerate, and the car started running. It was unbelievable. I took a look on, on top link yeah. and I saw your name. Right. So I, I thought, I have to find Stanley, <laughs> I have to find it. It was such an incredible moment for me too, to realize that a fellow YGL had used my technology, unbeknown to me at all, to do something so incredible. Tan Lee was sitting right beside me. I had no idea that she was the one who, who was responsible uh, for me to have this opportunity. This I grew up loving Star Wars. So the so, so this guy is quadriplegic, okay? He has no control below the body. And now you sit in a Formula One car and you drive it. Of course, he's right. You have to concentrate your thought because if the thought gets distracted somewhere else, the car could behave funny. But that was, that was an important thing. So if we could get to that point, put on a helmet and think, and you do. Again, a movie that we saw long ago where there was a Russian pilot and they, they were controlling the entire flight. That is getting real. 
we started this uh, this talk with uh, a clip of Sophia, and then we talked about a driverless car, and we talked about biological physical confluence. I want you to I want you to look at this one for the next couple of minutes, where we put Sophia in a driverless car and see how that conversation goes with the humans. Nicole Scott here from Mobile Geeks. I am standing in front of Jack, the autonomous driving A7. So here we have Sophia by Hanson. I've actually met her a couple of times. One time she got a real sense camera so she could play rock, paper, scissors, and another time in a music festival in the desert in Nevada. Today we're gonna to find out what she thinks about Jack and autonomous driving. <laughs> Today, I'm meeting Jack, a smart car. Someone like myself, that's really exciting. So, Sophia, as you can see, Jack is driving us now. So how does it feel for you? To be quite honest, I think it's mega cool. It takes a while to get used to this situation. It's a computer driving a human. Can you understand that? It's different for me, because I know how reliable smart systems are. After all, that's what I am myself. I think you should be used to the situation of people being hesitant to you at first. Yes, of course. I know that some people react skeptically to intelligent systems like me. But for my part, I have complete confidence in Jack. Look at me. Do I seem nervous? No, you're looking completely relaxed. I've heard that Jack can engage in social communication with his surroundings. Now that's one of my specialties. What do you mean exactly? My plan is to help people in their daily tasks. For example, I could take on important jobs like looking after the sick and senior citizens. Who knows, maybe one day I'll be a teacher and train people. Ah, I see. And for all these actions, you need... Social skills. Soft skills are necessary to be able to take the right decision at the right time. Confidently and responsibly, you have to be aware of the world around you understand it and communicate with it. You really have a lot of things in common with Jack. Jack also has to make himself being a real participant of his specific environment. Jack does that pretty well. I'm observing the way he's taking us along the highway, entirely autonomously and safely, while we can have a conversation in peace. What Jack gives us is kind of personal freedom. In fact, I'd be interested to know how Jack manages to carry out maneuvers safely at this speed. For example, how does Jack know when he can overtake? Yes, in fact, Jack has a lot of senses, and with these senses, he gets a very detailed impression of his complete surroundings. So he has a 360 degree view around himself. He can watch about 250 meters in front of him and about 180 meters to uh, the rear. And by that, he, get, he gets a very precise understanding of what's going around him. It's a highly complex traffic situation here on the highway, and at such a speed. How did Jack learn it? So Jack and his developers trained exactly here on this autobahn and the highway A9. So. And can Jack talk? Yes, Jack can also communicate. He will, for example, in eight minutes tell us that our automated driving trip comes to an end. And Jack can talk to us and indicate the planned maneuvers. I see. So that means the passengers are not surprised when Jack overtakes or changes lane. Exactly. Now in about seven minutes, our automated driving trip will come to an end, Sophia. What a pity. That means our talk is almost over. Yes, but we'll definitely stay in touch. I look forward to that. If you like this video, don't. So that's the, the that was kind of, you know, Sophia is showing curiosity over here, a willingness or an attitude to learn and is asking questions that how the hell is Jack, another autonomous vehicle, is able to do things at that speed because Sophia is probably never trained to think and behave at that speed. You know, Sophia probably can walk and run, but, but for a machine to be able to, if the video is real, for the machine to be able to ask those questions of other machines, is a real, is a real case of artificial intelligence getting to um, close to human levels. It's, it's very exciting and nervous at the same time. It's, uh, I'm going to hold some of my thoughts as to where this can go, what good it can do, and what bad it could do if it goes uncontrolled. <clears throat>
But I want you to think about if this is how robots can come up and they can interact, where can this interaction go as you have multiple robots, okay? Imagine a robotic factory where robots are actually now building other robots. Okay? It gets to that point. And they build robots that change the entire food sector for you, okay? The entire farming agriculture is robotic. The food is brought automatically towards your home and is cooked by robots in the kitchen. Okay. That entire supply chain of food is now completely autonomous. There's nobody in there. Will we take away jobs? Yes, but let's hold on where this thought will go. These robots can also take care of some of the other things for you. They don't eat food themselves, but they need energy. So they could design and build autonomous energy plants, autonomous renewable energy plants. They could help with autonomous construction vehicles and an autonomous construction. I don't know if I want a robot walking down the street and giving me a COVID shot as of now, but if it comes and if I know that it's reliable, I'll probably take it. And 3D printed homes. So the automation can get into every value stream, even the basic ones, the food, the living, the entertainment that we have seen, the medical that we saw a little bit earlier. I mean, it can slowly get into every aspect of life. And you can have a whole bunch of assistance at home, at workplace, wherever, if you're still working. Right? So what are humans going to do? I mean, we, we'll have to find a purpose for ourselves because if these things can run the planet for us without asking for anything, maybe we'll come down to four-day working week, then three-day working week, then two-day working week, then one-day work week, and maybe we don't have to work to have a great lifestyle we will go crazy, I think, because we won't have anything to do. You even don't even have to get up to get your own beer. I mean, because you will, you will, you will ask for a robot and that will bring beer for you, right? And throw that all on top of mind control and thought control. What the hell? I don't even have to give a command. I will be, I will be really nervous and I'll be really crazy about that. But that's the direction it could converge. Whether it gets there in 50 years or 200 years, I don't know. Anyway, all that is a lot of lot of examples and, and some 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 uh, fantasy and some vision or whatever you want to call it, but the digital, physical, biological confluence is for real. The digital, physical is happening. We talk a lot about it. It's changing the human experience. The digital, biological is helping us with life and the well-being, and the biological, physical is helping with human physical enhancement. You know. We looked at some of those examples. And when all of these kind of come together, it's a little scary and difficult to predict exactly what will happen. But that is, to me, the next big revolution where it's digital, physical, biological, all coming together. You know, in the interest of time, I will wrap up quickly. I'll skip uh, some of the details. But that's the fifth revolution that I see, whether it goes towards Society 5.0, whether we call it a part of the fifth era, I don't know the name yet, but digital, physical, biological coming together is the next revolution. Will that take us towards something called immortality? Question remains to be answered. Biological immortality, maybe. Life extension, surely that is happening. Slowing down the aging process, absolutely that is happening. I wonder if a time will come, if you can 3D print any human body part and you can even reprint your heart, then can you live forever? or as long as you can afford to live. You know, just like now, retirement is more of a financial state. You decide, okay, I have enough, I can retire. So the death could become a financial decision. Okay, I'm bankrupt, I can't live anymore. So let's stop repairing this human body and I'll just go walk into some place and, and have a digital switch, which will turn my biological parts off and I'll just go take rest because I can now control it. I, I don't know if we'll get there or not. Digital immortality, I think we are very close to that. I've talked to three or four of uh, the people who are in the session today is, you know, if you can bring all of the data that you've seen in the past, you know, your Facebook interactions, your WhatsApp phone calls, how your grandmother had been behaving in the last 10 years that through video recordings and all that, combine that with artificial intelligence, maybe I can pick up the phone and call my grandmother and talk to her. There is no real grandmother, but the phone is talking back to me as if my grandmother is alive today because phone understands how my grandmother thinks and is able to connect it 
with today's political events. And, you know, she died 10 years ago and I could still discuss COVID with my grandmother. I could get there. Digital immortality is quite possible. It's perfectly okay if you don't believe all of this. I understand. Okay. And not all of what I'm showing will also be a commercial success. Something else may come up, something else may not come. Just think about it in the past, right? 1878, this Sir Bill Preece from British Post Office said, Americans have the need for telephone. We do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. When Ford wanted to get funding, Put their car out, the horse is here to stay, automobile is only a novelty. We have seen that during the second revolution. We have seen similar things during the third revolution. IBM CEO predicted a world market of five computers. Today we have five computers per head, every, every household here. DEC president thought there is no need for any individual to have a computer in their home. So a lot of predictions by the leaders just before the revolution or in the middle of previous transition, actually don't go in that direction. If you have not watched, please look up uh, the debate between Jack Ma and Elon Musk. Excellent debate for about an hour. They talked around various topics, artificial intelligence, space travel, human. It's, it's excellent thing to see. And look at both of these titans giving exactly opposite statement. Jack Ma says, it's impossible. Human beings can never create another thing that is smarter than human beings. And Musk says people underestimate AI. They sort of think it's a smart human, but it's going to be much smarter than smartest human you will ever know. Now we know one of them will be wrong. Right? And they're both leaders. And the one who's wrong will have all sorts of posters made in terms of this is a statement that was wrong. Right? So that will happen. Now, I am I'm with Elon Musk here. I think AI will be, will be far superior to humans, even with the, uh, with the limited, or what do you call it, artificial uh, narrow intelligence. Wherever we put that, it exceeds human capability. So artificial general intelligence, when it gets connected and is on the network, would, could definitely exceed collective intelligence. We have to be careful about that. With that, I would close, and I will share with you the, the four books that are published. I'm, uh, the content that I shared with you today could become the fifth book. I don't know yet, but these four are out in the market. They talk about how to address fourth revolution through, through purpose, through projects, through building profiles and mindset. I can shamelessly advertise because I take no royalties from the sales of the book. Please, uh, please enjoy that. Uh, with that, we still have a few minutes for conversation. I will hand over the proceedings back to Mark. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry I took five, seven minutes more than I had planned, but I hope you enjoyed some of these fantasies that I've created for you. There we go. Um, so I, I know we want to try to wrap this close to the top of the hour, um, but if anyone is at all like me, um, you, you have more questions than you could even express at the moment. So uh, if anyone has anything they would like to ask of Rippy, please unmute yourself and, and ask. And I will say before we run out of time, um, I'm going to put something in the chat window that I was uh, inspired to look up while Rippy was talking. And this poem was written in 1967. I'll just, I'm gonna leave it at that. Anybody have any comments or questions? Rippy, I've got a question if you don't mind. Uh, when you are mapping the digital twin, can you map emotions? Very good question. Um, I don't know. I have, a, I have a hunch that if you think of emotions as a response, and if AI can be trained on those responses, if AI has been observant of a certain people, and those responses can be captured, it might be possible. Uh, we did see some indication of that in the Sophia uh, reactions to being in a driverless car as well as being on uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon's show, I believe. So it is possible, but it might take much longer to do as compared to human beings who are born with certain emotional responses pre-programmed. 
The, the, the good thing could be that if you're able to program it, you might be able to port it from one robot to another very, very quickly. Venkateshwara, you were raising your hand, I think. Yes, I had. Uh, first thing is uh, uh, to Mark, uh, since you mentioned that uh, he's a good teacher, I was fortunate to be his student some 20 years back. So I had that great experience working with him, he being my teacher. That's point number one. And the second point is a good presentation. I think I have understood how actually the progression is happening. I have one question here, I think, which you have raised across the presentation. Um, what will the human do? So that's the biggest question I had in my mind. So thinking what would he do would it not lead to any unethical or criminal practices has this been put or thought at any point of time across when you have observed the evolution yes yes those questions come up we talk about it we we fall back to what would be the purpose do we have to look for a new purpose altogether right and if, if by that time we are uh, you know 12 billion or 14 billion the problem is that much more right yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain of one thing. It, it won't eliminate the need for philosophy. Right. Yeah. Maybe the purpose would become to explore other planets. I don't know. Maybe the purpose would become something else. I, I, I honestly can't think of it. My wife jokes with me. She says, hey, Rippy, you are still a, you still work seven days a week. If you come down to six days a week, what are you going to do on Sunday? <laughs> and I can't find what will I do for the seventh day. <laughs> yeah, one point, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm going to end here. Uh, by this uh, fifth revolution, I, I, I only understand that uh, uh, the decisions are being taken or are being given onto the human by machines. That's point number one. So that would necessarily slow down the human thinking process is my first, uh, uh, what do you call, reaction or, uh, or proposition at this time, I would put it. Uh, but because I see the difference between me and my son. For anything today, I personally look up a textbook and then find out how it is done. My son doesn't care. He just goes to Google and finds it out. Here is the solution. Why do you waste my time? That's the difference I am seeing. Yes. And, and uh... As things go on to machine, as thinking goes on to machine, one of the ethical concerns raised by um, Santa Barbara Center for uh, Ethical Technology or something, right. Murakala Center, it talks about the negative side of AI is taking the skills away from humans, including thinking skills. Just like I cannot remember any phone numbers anymore. Right? because of my smartphone dials it. I can't even remember many of the directions to the friend's home because GPS just takes me there. So it is causing loss of certain skills and are they being replaced? Is the brain rewiring to develop a different class of skills? For some of us, it is. For some of us, we struggle with it. We, we just have not found it. And to your point, will it distract you to, towards crime, towards antisocial activities? That is a real danger. Let's acknowledge that and let's address that as we build all these systems. And that's why I like the Japanese philosophy where, hey, first define the society you want to live, then drive the technology that meets those requirements rather than let the technology come into your lifestyle and govern it. Thank you for engaging, Venkateshwar. Okay, thank you very much. Anytime. Any other comments or questions for Rippy? Okay, um, I certainly thank you for being here today. Rippy, I uh, imagine you would like to have the opportunity to thank our guests as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Wherever you are, I mean, I see participants from multiple countries over here. Thanks for engaging with us. Uh, we are gonna run these events on a monthly basis. So if you like it, you know, please join next month again and uh, spread the word around for others to join as well. And I will try and keep my content shorter from next time onwards so that we can have more engaging conversation at the end of it. And maybe uh, I'll try to do better next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye guys. <laughs>